I have a few things to report from the wonderful world of Renegade University. So October 8th to the 10th will be the event of the year. This is Renegade University weekend in Texas in the barbecue capital of Lockhart, just south of Austin at the great Buck Johnson's house. He's the host of the Counterflow podcast, which is part of the Renegade Media Network. This weekend is sponsored by Counterflow and your favorite CBD suppliers, Paloma Verde CBD. At this event, you will hang out with Hotep Jesus, Cody Wilson, Scott Horton, Jack the Perfume Nationalist, and Deirdre McCluskey, as well as me and Buck Johnson. So go to renegadeuniversity.com slash Texas for more information and to enroll. By the way, we're going to have two activities. One will involve shooting guns and the other involves smelling perfume only at Renegade University. The other two things I want to tell you about, I've got my webinar coming up very soon. This is one, this one is very close to my heart. It's the history of the American left. Can't wait to teach this one. Again, go to renegadeuniversity.com slash courses to get more information and to enroll in a webinar that will take you from abolitionism through progressivism and socialism and communism and the civil rights movement and Black Lives Matter and feminism and all the rest of it. It'll be part personal history and very much American history. So I hope to see you in class there. And then, of course, you're going to hear a lot about the great philosophers Deleuze and Guattari in this very interview with Daniel Coffin. His webinar is also coming up. Go to renegadeuniversity.com slash courses to sign up for Daniel's webinar on Deleuze and Guattari, which you'll hear a lot about right now. I hope to see you in class. Thanks. Thanks to ZocDoc for supporting Unregistered. With ZocDoc, you can search for local doctors who accept your insurance, read verified patient reviews, and book an appointment either in person or via video chat. Go to ZocDoc.com renegade and download the ZocDoc app to sign up for free and to book a top rated doctor. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. I believe that my guest this week is the philosopher of freedom but he would probably argue with me about that. This is my interview with Daniel Coffeen. I am joined from San Francisco, California by the great, the magical, the wondrous, the wizard of Renegade University, Daniel Coffeen. And uh, we're gonna start off by, uh, I'm gonna ask you something, Daniel, that I, um, I've been thinking about for a long time and I just, I have no answers to this. And so you're going to help me and you're going to help all of us. This is pretty Seven. important. I want to start. Yeah. So you're a guy, you know, you do, you do rhetoric. You have a PhD in rhetoric from UC Berkeley, the most famous rhetoric department in the world. You study language. This is what you do. Well, I have been wondering about the alphabet. Can we talk about the alphabet? You know, I like talking about the alphabet. We, uh, is there, well, like what people are going to be like, what do you mean the alpha? Who cares? There's nothing to talk about. It's just, it's letters exactly. that form exactly. words. And one of the great moves McLuhan makes, which is he talks, he meant back up. Who say it again? Who, what? Marshall McLuhan, the yes. great Marshall McLuhan, right? The great media theorist, Canadian media theorist. Um, he makes the great move of, of, of creating this, this figure of the environment. 
right? And the environment is precisely the very conditions in which you live that you are not aware of, that you take for granted as the truth, right? Foucault ends up calling it, you know, being in the truth, mm-hmm. right? You're just inside it, you know, right? The things that get rejected from it are rejected automatically because it's a mechanism, right? Um, okay. And so the alphabet is, for McLuhan, is an environment, mm. right? And, it's, and it, he considers it the job of the artist, the job of the critic to expose environments, right? To reveal them, because that's what we're always operating in, right? Hmm. Hmm. Th- you know, we take for granted as the truth, we take for granted as common sense, we take for granted just the way it is, like the alphabet. And, you know, it is, you know, he's mapping the sort of movement from the oratory society, you know, into the visual, right? Where, uh, you know, from, from, again, from oratory to the written word, the privileges, you know, movement from the ear to the eye, mm-hmm. right? Because the ear, is all at once. It's another great McLuhanism, the all at once, one word, right? Like it comes from every direction all around. You're sort of immersed in it, right? It's not linear, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then you get the rise of, of written words and, and specifically the alphabet, the phonetic alphabet, right? And it's about everything being in its place. You think about how you construct a word, how you construct a sentence, how you construct a paragraph, right? It is mechanistic. Yeah. Right? It's, it's about That's- a certain atomism of the social. Oh, right. Um, an atomism, the social atomism of, of, of being, right? Everything in its place. So you can see in the alphabet and in the construction of uh, what we call language, linguists call language, you can see the factory, for instance, right? Hmm. Um, right? Everything adds up, everything, you know, uh, is cumulative, everything's in its place, moving out of its place, and everything gets screwed up. Right? And, everything's, uh, and everything's linear. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And it's, and that's, and it's for him, for McLuhan, it's all about the, you know, the, the, the privileging of the eye, right. Is this movement towards um, sort of the, again, the isolation of the subject where sound is really participatory, right. And whole groups of people and it's coming from every direction. You get the rise of um, uh, the sort of rise of democracy, right. Of, of sort of atomistic living and the alphabet go hand in hand there. That is the environment in which we live that produces us. That's what's incredible for McLuhan about the environment. It produces us, right? Mm-hmm. So we're just existing as little like mm-hmm. cops in the machine of a certain view of language. So in fact, in my dissertation, I argue that there's no such thing as language, right? Because language is all premised on um, reference and it's, yep. pre- it's premised on, um, uh, uh, again, the sort of, again, the sort of linearity the sort of, of, of the need to signify something that's not present. And the idea of a system that is um, distinct from the world in which you live. And so my whole dissertation was, I would say, instead of language, let's talk about rhetoric, right? And let's talk about the basic unit of meaning. It's not the word, but the trope, right? It's an event. And the trope is a whole distribution of meaning, right? It's a whole set of relationships. Mm-hmm. Right. So in uh, Nietzsche's On Truth and Lies, he talks about the, um, you know, w- words are one sided uh, interpretations of a thing. They're tropes, they're metaphors. So, for instance, you know, the example I'd always use in my classroom was, you know, w- you look up at the sky, you see that thing that comes out at night. Right. That someone gets brighter and goes away sometimes. And here we call it the moon. And I'm not quite sure of the etymology of that, but one argument is it comes from the cyclical nature. Right from like men's, uh, the Europeans, the Romance languages look up at it and they go la luna. Right, one sees light, the other sees cycle. Both are correct. It's not a matter of correct. Right, the first, the, the naming of something is already a trope. It's already a metaphor, and it's a, and that metaphor is a relationship between me and it, and it and meaning. It's a whole casting of a set of relations. Right. <laughs> it's not just a word. That, that, that we it's went not, deep quickly, didn't we, Thaddeus? What's that? We went deep quickly. Um, well, that's what we do. I, I'll make. I was going to make a sexual reference, but I'll I'll decline. The um, so okay, hold on though. I want to go back to this thing about the alphabet though. And it, would you call it the atomism or atomization of society? Yeah, right. Which is, unpack it, that. Like, yeah, and, and and for a second there, it sounded like that was a bad thing from you, and then it, then later it sounded like it might be a good thing. Like it's about democracy, but it's also. Not so good. I don't know. It's a factory. It's a factory, but it's democracy. I, I don't, 
Open that yeah. up a bit. It always sounds like I'm passing judgment. I'm also just trying to point things out. Sure. No, I know. Like a Jew from New York, it always sounds like you're passing, you know, sweeping, sweeping judgment on things. Like, Jews from New York um, do that. Yeah. Yeah. That seems to be, it's also the assumption. People always assume you're saying something <laughs> about something as opposed to just saying that's what it is. Right. Um, yeah. To be honest, I'm not an historian, right? But I, I see it in contemporary society, right? The sort of the will to atomization of that both corporations and the state have. Right. It's, it's, it's to isolate you. I mean, we grew up with a phone in the house and everyone gathered around the phone. Right now, you know, we're going to isolate you. So everybody has the phone, their own phone. Right. And the, okay. and the, dream, the dream of the corporate state of, of, corp, of the corporation, of course, is one to one marketing. Right. I know exactly what you are. I can give you exactly what you want. Right. I, I'm going to serve it up to you before you even know it, because it's just right. for you. You can see ads for you, which might be a good thing. Sure, sure, sure. That's okay, what I'm good, 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 good. Right, and the right. other side, of course, is the state loves it because they know everything about you, right? And they yes. have you isolated from everybody. And else. that's never a good thing. <laughs> the question is, right? Can we separate the two? And what, we, right. of course, as a, the quick tangent we've seen is that the, 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 the rise of tech, the corporation, the tech corporation, and the state are one and the same thing. Okay. So the alphabet. How does the alphabet atomize society? Um. It is, it's not that it atomizes society per se, but that it is of an atomized environment in which everything has a distinct part, right? A, a, a sound is very different than a letter that has, very, you know, you can't, if you fuck with the drawing of a letter, it's incoherent. It's no longer legible. With sound, there's always a legibility, right? There's, there's always something happening. Okay. Right? It's, it's a strict rule set in which each thing is sort of discrete. It's Got always it. these three parts that get plugged in like, like Lego. Right. It's sure. a lot less messy. Look at the picture behind me, right? That's like that's that's an that's an auditory space, mm -hmm. right? It's all at once, things coming from all these different directions. The alphabet breeds a kind of it wills a kind of linearity, it is both the product and the producer of linearity. Nice. And McLuhan says the alphabet is an environment, not a tool. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 the very terms in which you're existing, right? It's like you said, we ask people. You know what, what do you think of the alphabet? They don't, they don't even see it. Right? They're like, what do you? Mean? That's just, that's what you have. What else do you have? Right. Right. Um, which is weird, right? And so for McLuhan, the whole job of the artist or the critic is to point out that the things that you take most for granted are the very things that sort of determine you and you determine. Um. Okay. So when I was about eight years old, my mother was talking about my father, they were divorced at that point. And my father was a computer scientist. He was scientistic, he worshiped science and scientists. I mean, truly, they were his heroes and he thought that they were just the most, and he hated my whole postmodern, you know, truth is relative, yada, yada, just he screamed at me about it. And my mother, on the other hand, was like an English major at Cal, Berkeley, you know, and she read novels and she could draw all these inferences from the text and her mind would go in 20 different directions as I, as mine did when I was reading, right. I'm a, I was always been, a, always been a very slow reader. I don't know about you because I read one word and I think about 10 different things from it. Right. So she said to me, I was telling her about my father, how like he couldn't understand, you know, drawing different meanings from a text, things like that. Right. And she said to me, Oh, well, that's because he's a linear thinker and we are abstract thinkers. And I thought, oh my gosh, my mother is so brilliant. And I guess I'm smarter than other people because I'm an abstract thinker. And I have used that example. I have said that dozens and dozens of times. I've said it in my classrooms. I've said, it, but I, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Yeah. I mean, come on. The fact is <laughs> most, most people who think like they're in the humanities, right? And study yeah, other, right. In fact, they fall into the same scientific, scientific trap of trying to abstract, trying to come up with universals. Right of of if science at its best is a radical empiricism, which which runs contrary to the universal its claims universal truth. Right, mm -hmm. science somehow got wrapped up with this idea of, of repetition of the same thing to establish a fixed position once and for all. When I, I I prefer to see science as again empirical and creating formulas that might be more or less local. Right, and you might want to generalize. Right. But it still has a kind of radical empiricism where a lot of um, at its best, it has a radical empiricism where a lot of literary analysis, um, 
you know, doesn't ever read the text. This text is an example of patriarchy. This text is an example of, of you know, misogyny, of capitalism. It's, a, it's exemplar. They're not actually reading the thing. Right. It's an abstraction. It, that's a scientific approach. Why is that scientific? Because it's trying to establish the, 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 the species and the subspecies, right? The oh. genus and the species, right? So you have this thing, the category, and this thing plugs into it, and it's yeah. basically a taxonomy. Right, where what we want from literature, but we actually want from all thought. So the, mis- the I, that's why I can never just say public discourse, right? Because they divide these things: religion yeah. from science, the humanities. I'm like, what are you talking about? Talk- Nietzsche's great at this because he isolates a will, and the will can be can operate in different places at different times, right? In different guises, right? So just because one studies literature doesn't mean one's an abstract thinker and not scientific. And just because one does science doesn't mean you're a scientist. Right. 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 Okay. But, yeah. but I mean, wouldn't you say that there are some people who are incapable of the kinds of thinking we're talking about here? Yeah. I think, I think there's all kinds of different thinking. I mean, yeah, you know this, right? I mean, we've talked about having kids. I, my kid thinks very differently than I do, puts things mm-hmm. together, literally makes connections where I don't see them. I see mm-hmm. make connections and he doesn't see them. Right? I mean, people think differently, right? Thinking is the act of creating a little machine, grabbing some of this, grabbing some of that, right? This is this is my Deleuze and Guattari, right? You can come take my class and I'll talk all about it, right? But oh, the yeah? thing is this way of think, linking things up together, right? So, well, I was just trying to get at how I'm a, superior thinker to other people if and i know that's where you're going for help that. Me with that would, okay so what you just knock that down you're just saying no you're just you're just as good as your dad i need to be i need hey i'm on an edible uh, mission here you, you need i need to be better than my dad for fuck's sake and that's why Play you're your here Play your dad i mean it sounds like you know if he's getting upset about what you would call him sort of postmodernism, then that doesn't strike me as very scientific right i mean science mm-hmm is of course the art of, of relativity in so many ways, right? Because it's empirical, it's positional, right? I mean, it's I'm here, that thing's there. This is the conditions from my vantage of how the system works, right? I mean, it's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Deleuze calls himself an empiricist, right? And that sort of blew my mind and sort of opened up my thinking, right? And I was like, oh, I'm, that's all I want to do. That's all phenomenologies. It's all, it's Buddhism, right? It's, I'm just engaging the world as it's happening. I'm taking it in through all my senses, right? And I'm just sort of reckoning it. I don't, I don't have a will to shut down the empirical world to discover some truth outside the empirical, like the Platonists, like any religion, like almost every philosophy ever. Okay. Right. So empiricism to you is what? It's like a process of gathering? It's a, it's a, it's it, gathering information, gathering data, gathering it's 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 your it's situatedness, right? Empiricism is I am here taking in all these things. Yeah. I'm not trying to reduce them to something that's not here. I'm not trying to create a meta category that will explain this. I'm looking at the sort of mechanisms, the operations of this environment that I am in and that I am constitutive of, that I'm a cog within. Mm-hmm. Right. So in empiricism, you are undone. Right. So if mm-hmm. if a classic you know, view of a scientist is like they're in their lab somewhere outside the fray, outside the sort of team of what they're studying. They're in white coats, they're in a white room. Mm-hmm. Right? If they're not there, right? They might discover something great because they were clever. Um, but that's not science, right? You, you, you're in the mix, man, right? <laughs> you're in the mix. You, you get dirty with, 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 with whatever you're doing. Science is gonzo. Empiricism is gonzo. So you're, okay, so your empiricism is, you said this already, but it's very much Zen. It's very much mindfulness. Um, when I do Headspace, you know, Andy, the narrator, says one of the first things he says is, you know, um, after you close your eyes and you, you uh, focus on your breath and your body, he then says, now, listen for any sounds around you, any smells, any smells around you. Notice them. Just notice them. Don't judge them. Just Let them and let them come to you. Don't go out and get them. Let them come to you. And for me, and I I know a lot of people, that's radical. That's radical. radical. Because we don't live that way. We don't. We, in fact, are very busy ignoring those things to fix a problem or accomplish something or conquer something else or, right? 
Uh, right. yeah, those yeah, things, yeah. those things are, those are, that's, those are the things that children do. Children yeah. notice, children notice the small things, the smells, Sometimes, the yeah. sounds around you and they focus on them and they spend time with them. We don't have time. Kids are also idiots, you know, so, you know, I mean, it's are stupid, but the thing about <laughs> that stupidity is a virtue. It is. It is. It can be when it's deployed well. Yeah. I mean, Submitting is the as the foundational state, right? I mean, that's the beginner's mind of Buddhism, right? Like, but so that moment of just, and I said gathering, a gathering, um, but it's even more passive than that, I suppose, right? You're just, you're letting the sounds come to you in a sense. I mean, but is that your empiricism? Yeah, but except I'd make it more middle voice, right? So I know not to be pedantic, right? But instead of active versus passive, right? It's the middle voice. I see in as much I am, as I am something that can be seen. I look at you, you look at me. It is a, it is a feedback loop. I mean, feedback loops, active, passive suggests oh, I'm isolated and then I enter, right? And there's relative active and passive, of course, right? Right, a wind pushes over a leaf more. Of course, the wind is also reflected by the leaf, right? I was looking at the trees with my son down, um, down Ocean Beach, right? Those, I think they're cypresses, is that what mm -hmm. those are? And what I love about those trees, I, fucking love those trees is they're very growing. They're very constitution. The very way they move through the world involves the wind. You can see it. Yes, I know. Yeah. The wind is in their DNA. Yep. So is that active? Is that passive? Is the wind making them do that? It's the middle voice, right? It's both active and passive. The tree is growing with the wind. This concept of the middle voice is new to me. I did not take okay. it. Yeah. What is, is this oh, yeah. literature classes? Is this what you learn in literature classes? Yeah, you know what it is? It's, uh, it's two things. One, it's my like three days in the classical Greek workshop at Berkeley before I broke down weeping with the labor of it and switched <laughs> to German. <laughs> uh, but the phenomenologist talk, you know, Merleau-Ponty, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, French 20th century phenomenologist talks about um, this middle voice, right? Neither active nor passive. Right? And it's, it's also a figure that runs through a fair amount of I say Buddhism, I don't really know what that means. Um, through a certain literature of a certain philosophy that thinks about someone who calls himself the Buddha. So give me a couple examples of the middle voice. Um, again, if I look at, this is actually an opening assignment I used to give my students, uh, opening lecture, because they haven't read anything yet. Right. I say, okay, when you look at me, you look at anything around you, are you going to it or is it pushing inside of you? And if you you can kind of freak out, right? You can be like, oh my God, the world is entering my body all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, or you can be, you know, I'm back here and I'm looking and I'm going to it. Does my eye go to the object? Does the object go in my eye? Or is it, you know, Merleau-Ponty calls it a chiasmus, an intertwining, right? Marbling, right? Where you and the thing begin sort of going together and active and passive are still important because they're relative strategic positions, right? Nudging somebody to do something, right? It's not that active passive go away, but they're relative to a fundamental intertwining, if that makes so sense. So construct, co construct a sentence with a middle voice in it. Well, the, the French do it a lot, right? Um, I mean, I, I assume all the romance language, uh, je m'appelle, I call myself, right? Um, I, so they don't technically have the middle voice, but they turn, the, they turn yourself into both a subject and an object. Oh. So grammar, like an alphabet restricts our ability to speak in the middle voice, right? By simply having subjects of sentences, I run, I've separated me from action. The very premise of grammar, of, Amer of English grammar, yeah. is yeah. that there's a subject that is distinct from the actual life of that subject. Yeah, so grammar is yeah. logical and linear, and you were saying that it's just one way of thinking it's not any better or worse than other ways of thinking, but aren't we now showing that it actually restricts thought? You just said that. It does, it restricts thought. Yeah, it's, it's, it has its time and place. My point is I don't want it to go away completely. I just don't want it to be the privileged position. Yeah. Obviously sometimes being objective and a scientist not getting in the mix is a good thing. Okay. It's just not always inherently the good thing. There's no center, right? That's, there's all these different ways in. I would, Deleuze and Guattari call the rhizome, right? Like there's all these different ways in. I love this. Mental. Okay, you know? I love this so far. Uh, so the alphabet is one way of thinking. It's linear. It's like a factory. It's an environment that produces things, us, subjects, people, minds, as well as being produced by the minds, of course. And it has limitations and it limits ideas 
So what are you proposing as an alternative? Yeah, so what I, you know, in my, as an alternative to language, again, I suggested rhetoric, that if we should learn rhetoric, not language, meaning we should always learn to operate with language. As opposed to you sit in a classroom, you say, here's your, here's a verb and here's how you subjugate. Is that subjugate? No, is that what it's called? What are you doing? What do you do with a verb? You break down, I, I, I go, she goes, he goes, right? Um, um, conjugate? Conjugate, there we go, not subjugate. <laughs> it is a kind of subjugation. Um, when you're conjugating, it is, it is subjugation. Your classroom, right? You're, you're conjugating your verbs, you're learning vocabulary words. You're not situated, right? Your only situation is in a classroom and you're looking at language as an object. As opposed to rhetoric where you're always operating. There's no such thing as not de- recreating the world. Language is not a common tool set that we all come to to use to communicate. That's, that's the wrong figure. What we are is a whole series of bodies constantly bumping up and situating ourselves from our vantage with other bodies in their situations. That's called rhetoric. It's always contextual. It's always situational. Oh. Right? Right. So, you know, Heidegger calls it thrownness, right? You're, you're in the world in this way with this body and this situation and this time and place. And you're always going with other bodies. Right. It's more it's more akin to the social becomes more akin to astronomy or physics or chemistry. Right. Than um, ethics or morality. Right. Mm-hmm. Bodies will go with other bodies. So the diagram behind me, right, it's Matthew Ritchie painting. But he begins to draw diagram how I imagine an empirical moment. Right. You're like, OK, that's going this little circle. I got this little feeling over here. This bubbles up with this one. It shoots up here. And, <laughs> right. And I feel like that's what he's constantly diagramming is like a cosmogenesis, the constant emergence of the world, of, of the cosmos, you know. Right. And there are no straight lines in that drawing. Not really. I don't think there are. Not really. Any. Yeah. Coming down, there's, this claims to be, we can't tell they're going down or coming up. Right. right. Uh, it's like uh, Frank Geary's architecture in that way. At 100%. Yeah. It's always a, a point of inflection, right? It's always a shade. That's right. That's right. And so that would be called postmodern right there. Yeah, 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 that's what I always call this, right? There's no center. It's always bodies going with bodies. That's yeah. why, for me, rhetoric and what they call the postmodern, that's why they synced up. Yeah, because rhetoric has always been that thing. Modern, that. modern architecture. Um, it was reacting to previous architecture, pre-modern architecture, which had lots of undulations and curves, and you know the great cathedrals and churches, and right. Um, and then they got into straight lines and squares. Yeah, and rectangles yeah. and boxes. Yeah. And then, then the postmodernists came along in the 20th century and reacted to that and started to bring back the undulations, but not in the service of God, in the service of nothing in particular. Love that. Yeah, I love that. And one, one way for me to look at it is to say, um, like the, the modernists were so obsessed with geometry. Yeah. The thing about geometry is it's three dimensions. The one missing thing is time, is change. Yeah. Right? And shapes are always changing. Right. And so by Frank Gehry, it's temporal, right? That building is coming into being. Yeah. Yeah. It's out. It's an attempt to take things out of time, like mathematics. Exactly. Right. Because mathematics is not context is not supposed to be a part of math. Right. It's supposed to be out of context. It's supposed to be on its own in a vacuum. It always tells you the truth, no matter who's speaking it, no matter what room it's in, no matter what country it's in, no matter what year it's in. Mathematics always says the same thing. And that same thing is always the truth. The thing that's weird about math is that is that it the formulas themselves are situatedness, right? So I always picture math. I, I, I've been wrestling math recently. There's a philosopher called Alain Badiou, you know, contemporary oh, sure. guy. Yeah, yeah. It, right? So he's obsessed with it. I've been trying to make sense of his book, Being an Event. And he's always open with this thing about math. And mm. I've always shrugged my shoulders, shrugging my shoulders. So one day I'm really stoned and I sit with the book and I read that introduction. I was like, oh, for him, from what I gather, math is simply, it is radically empirical, right? And the fact is with the, the empirical world, everybody in it has a value. It just does. There's values and operations, right? You have a tree, you have a leaf, you have the wind, you have a bug, right? There's a certain value. And that's what numbers and math are. Each thing has a value. That's one, that's three, that's 2.6. And then there's the operations between them. And in a way, math is the language of the radically empirical because it's not judgmental, right? It's free of morality. It's beyond good and evil. Right. I think that's what he's going for. It's the pure event. It's just these things arranging themselves. Right. I think what you is when math gets applied to a truth and wants to bend all these other things, 
to a formula, but the formula itself, you see the creativity of mathematicians to create new formulas, to create new relationships between these given values. Everything has a value. It always already does. And that value changes depending on the situation. Right? A two in one situation means one thing, two in another situation means something very different. Right? Two times 23 million, two to the, to the exponent of 23 million, right? They're very different things. Two remains two. And then it's inflected through all these different modes of operations. And I think the great mathematicians, again, it sort of eludes me because I'm a little dyscalculic. I get screwed up with numbers and up and down uses me sometimes. Me too. Um, I've realized that I've gotten older, but they, just like artists, right? You know, just like Picasso and Brock sort of splayed and created cubism, right? And they created all the multi-dimensions of, the, of what we think of as the flat plane became this multi-dimensional thing, right? And sort of splaying um, being, they, these mathematicians, you know, like Leibniz with the differential calculus, Newton with the regular calculus, you know, mm-hmm. um, create a, a new set of relationships between these values, right? And there's something very beautiful about that. I wish, um, I was gonna say, I wish I understood it better. If I wanted to, I would study it. I guess I don't really wish it, but I think it'd be interesting to, you know, take a good math class, you know? <laughs> Um, well, I think it, I think it, it I think oh, the of math are very different than the claims of certain kinds of science, the claims of certain kinds of literature, the claims of certain kinds of well, all religions, um, right? All religions look like certain kinds of science, right? I mean, yeah. but um, yeah, it's a different will. When I used to choose a doctor, I was really just picking a name randomly from some list on some medicine website, or maybe the hospital assigned me a doctor. I didn't know anything about them. How could you? So when I moved to the Bay Area two years ago, I needed to find a new doctor. And thank God, ZocDoc.com was around. And I downloaded their app. I read patient reviews of all the doctors in my area. I found out which ones took my insurance. And I was able to judge and vet from a huge array of doctors. So I found the right one for me. I had an appointment with him just last week, and I'm thrilled. For the first time, I actually felt like I really chose the right doctor for me because of ZocDoc.com. So... Now is the time to prioritize your health, right? Like me, you probably skipped some things you should have tended to during the pandemic. Now is the time to get back. So download the app. Go to ZocDoc.com slash Renegade. Download that app and sign up for free. And you can book a top rated doctor immediately. Many of those doctors are available as soon as today. So that's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Renegade. No, hang on, Caffeine. Um, what are you saying? It's situational. Two plus two always equals four, according to mathematics. I don't. What's your What's your point here? What do you mean it's in, situational? In, in right in a given, um, two plus two always equals four in a certain model of arithmetic. Right, it's, that's going to always be true. Two plus two equals four in that. But you can change the. We get into currency if you want, right? Because uh, the thing with math is that two in some sense is um, it's fungible, right? It, uh, one two is equal to every other two, right? It's fungible. Yeah. Right. Can be swapped out. Like a US dollar can be swapped out with another dollar, right? Right. They're absolutely equivalent. Um, but at the same time, uh, they are always serving a function. So that two, which is fungible, nevertheless, within a certain milieu, a certain formula, certain context takes on a different significance. So sometimes that two plus two equals four, yeah, in that context, that's sure, okay. Sure, certain things happen at range. Yeah, there's certain things happen in the world, sure. But right. that two, two can be inflected just so, I imagine, and plus can be inflected just so, unless you severely limit what plus means. It's a language, it's a set of relations. What relations do you want between these things? It's a false, my point is a false, it's a false distraction. It's a, it's a, it's a red herring. This, the discussion of two plus two equals four. That's, I hear my father screaming from the grave. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right now. The fact that he and I would agree at some point, right? Like it's about creativity with numbers. You, if you can show me the formula of two plus two equals five, show it, show me. It's beautiful. I can't say to you, I just wrote the greatest novel ever. And you, you got to take my word for it. I can't just force it, right? I actually have to write the greatest novel ever. Okay. So if you make two plus two equal five, which I can very, I can see how a two along a plane that's not flat, right? So if everything is undulating, okay, right? 
Okay. Two, and that two and that two is there. That another two could actually, if it's always situated, could be inflected by that fold of the cosmos, right? And the next thing you know, you end up with five. Well, that turns out that two is closer to a three. Okay. And then the question is, okay, in that world, what happens to two plus three? And in fact, if you were mapping, right? No, I forgot to turn off my. If you were mapping these equations, right, you it would be along a plane, right? You could say, um, you know, I love a crumpled up piece of paper, right? A two here, or you can't really see, right? A two here and a two up top here. Right. Two different things, and they're going to equal something different. What's your plane on which you're operating, right? Okay. All right. So, so okay. This was about a year ago. You may have noticed this. There was this big controversy, I guess. It was, I think it was a mathematics conference or something, and maybe some postmodernists infiltrated it. But on Twitter for several weeks there, and our, my friend James Lindsay, who teaches at RU with you, who's not on, our, not on your side on this stuff, you know, he, he went off on this, how like these mathematicians at the, some conference were saying that two plus two can equal five. And it became like this meme on, on the internet where everybody was making fun of it. And this was a way to like make fun of postmodernism, how crazy we are. Uh, yeah, I saw now, something about this. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's the, what's happening now. So yeah. The two right. plus two equals five controversy. So it's, it's a red herring. Not that we, neither one of us knows the ins and outs of that particular controversy, but how would you, what would you do with someone saying two plus two equals five? I guess you sort of answered it, but answer it yeah, again. What you're, what you're actually telling me is that people are saying this phrase which is a linguistic phrase, two plus two equals five. It is. And they're positioning themselves within a social world, which yep. is right with an epistemology and various other operations. And they want, they want something from you for saying that. I don't agree to any of this terms. That's why I don't engage in public discourse. I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't have to answer your question. It's a stupid question. Not you, that person saying that to me, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't have to talk to you. Like, I, let me frame the terms. Okay. And then let's begin again. Right? That's why I, I don't engage most of the time, right? I only like to teach because I can just create my worldview and then leave the room, you know? You don't engage in public discourse. Fuck yourself. You write books and a blog and you teach public courses. And what are you talking about? Yeah, it's funny though. I am receding from that, which we can talk about later. Are you? Don't I think so. I think I, I really, you know, I used to publish on my blog weekly for years, right? I had a pretty big readership and I just... I, during the last 18 months, whatever, what we've called, whatever the fuck is happening in this culture, I hate using all that language, um, is uh, I, I've written more than I've ever written. I don't publish a fucking thing. I've started like several books. I'm like 80 pages into this. I've written about 20. I, I started a blog post about rhetoric just in, on the Medium page yeah. uh, app just to kind of for yep. the group. I'm up to like 30 pages, right? Like it's not a blog post and it will never get published. So why do you do it? Pure pleasure. Just Absolute pleasure. ecstatic pleasure. And then when I don't take pleasure from it anymore, I, said, I found two half-written manuscripts on the desktop. I'd forgotten I'd written during this thing. But I stopped publishing. You know, I mean, I write for my company a bunch, you know? I yeah. a, um, and that's a, I like doing it. It's fun, but it's also part of a job. Um, but I, I believe everything I'm writing. And that's been pretty fun, but that's my only public writing for the most part. So instead of watching baseball games, you write. Yeah. Oh my God. The minute I'm done with whatever I got to do, my kid or work. Oh yeah. Comes. I don't like daytime. So it's good that that's when work happens is work. I don't like the day at all. Um, <laughs> mornings are okay. I generally sleep through them. I don't like the afternoons and then start like four, four 30. Shit gets interesting, you know, <laughs> that's right. And between like four, 4.30 and 8.30, I'll um, try to enter the stratosphere. Um, and then whatever comes, comes. What, sometimes why, good things, sometimes great things. Why, why is it that afternoons suck? They do. They do, right? It's, they it's, do. It's, it's because, again, time's not linear, right? So it's the <laughs> middle of the day it has this awful kind of stretch to it that's uncomfortable to be in, right? Like, who wants to be in that time? The sun's overhead, the yeah. world bent, gravity's bent a certain way. It's, well, I feel very visible because of the sun, right? I think. And and I feel especially responsible. I feel my obligations weighing on me heavily. I feel like I should be doing something right now because the lights are on and everybody's running around and doing stuff and everybody's at work except for me. Isn't it weird how, how organized time is? Yeah. Like, of course it is a society, but we have so many people and it's pretty well organized. 
you know, like it, no one ever says to me, yeah, no, call, we'll set that meeting up for maybe 3 a.m. No one ever says that, right? It's just, it's insane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Time mm-hmm. is so organized globally. I mean, uh, global consumers of capitalism, whatever you want to call it, it's done an incredible job of organizing time on a global scale. Right. Yeah. We need, we need a society to, to get together and talk about the afternoon issue. Yeah. This, and that's why I, you know, I always had this image in my head of what they do in Spain. I don't know. If this, the siesta, they, right. The siesta, yeah. You sleep. <laughs> I hope it's true. I keep hearing this too. And I keep thinking, oh yeah, three hours in the afternoon you take off. Of course, only a civilization would do that. Um, only a civilized people. Only a civilized people. Yeah. yeah. Related to that, when I was in, I spent a few weeks in Spain many, many, many years ago, mm-hmm. and I was blown away talking about a civilized society. Um, the bathrooms, the public bathrooms in Barcelona, sometimes the gender, sometimes they're not, but you have your own little room. Don't oh, give yeah. me, like, don't make me piss next to you heathens. Don't make me like sit in the stall, take a <laughs> shit, and like you can see my feet, my pants. Like, give me some, mostly it's about privacy from the social. If I go into the bathroom, give me privacy. It's not about being seen really while I'm pissing or shitting. It's about having a moment of repose from the frenzy of the social. And if you're a little introverted, like I am, like I, I, I kind of want that in American bathrooms, very uncivilized. You're still in the social in the bathroom. You want to be atomized. In uh, Spain, fucking A, I do. Yeah. When yeah. you're taking a shit, you do. Yeah. I just want to, I want to break. You know, I just want that break. Anyway, Spain's very civilized. And I, that's... All right. All right. Let's talk about currency. Um, is currency because you work for Anatha, mm-hmm. which is a cryptocurrency company, which is going to revolutionize the whole world, apparently. Um, tell us about currency. So here's the question, Caffeine. Is yeah. currency just a language? Exactly. Yeah, it's an environment, right? We first you get money. Currency is, is, is uh, the assignation and the, and the uh, terms of exchange of value. Right? What do you assign value to and how do you exchange, right? Okay. What, how can we sort of assign it? How can we organize bodies accordingly, right? Like labor and all this kind of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, money, what we call money is generally operated as an environment. Back to McLuhan, right? People think that money, this is, this is money. It's normal that 9 million people die of starvation a year, right? That's, that's normal. That's, that's just the way money is as opposed to the fact that money is designed. And that's the Bitcoin revolution. It's the postmodern moment in money. It's the deconstruction of money. Because what it reveals is that money, what we fiat currency, national currencies, have been designed to operate in a certain way. They could be operated differently to which Bitcoin. And after Bitcoin, 5,000 other currencies, they, they can operate all kinds of ways. For example, Anatha, we in our inflation model, every currency has a different inflation and distribution model, Mm -hmm. right? US dollar is a peculiar one. People who have not been elected, I think there's 13 of them, right? And the Federal Reserve Mm -hmm. make all kinds of decisions about when they'll print money and when they won't. They don't really announce it. You can go find out. They don't hide it per se, Mm -hmm. but you never know when they're going to do it. And then it's funny, I lived my whole life. I'm 51 years old. I thought I grew up a Marxist. I've studied postmodern philosophy. I never thought about where does the new money go? <laughs> and it's the answer is insane, right? It goes to the banks. Yep. Wait, wait, wait. Like it's, it's literally insane. Yeah. Right. So you see the design of the system. Like why do the rich get richer and the poor get poor? Oh, because they print money and give it to themselves. They just print money. And they give it to themselves. <laughs> it's so bizarre. They well, go, they got to pay uh, for stuff like wars and shit like that, you know. Petrol, petrol bomb based economy. Yeah. Well, it's petrol based, and because it's petrol based, you got to drop bombs. Yeah. Well, right. we also have your investment. Yeah. We also have like you know tens of millions of children to contain during the day, so that costs money. God, exactly. Uh, with exactly. guards, That's guards at their containers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, places um, they call schools. So, yeah, well, so what? That's that's the um, crypto revolution, right? I, people get in and get money. It's investment. No, what are you talking about? No, what it's it's nothing about. If you're thinking about cryptocurrency as a way, I'm going to take my U.S. dollars. I'm going to buy this thing. It's going to go up in value. I'm going to have more U.S. dollars. Right? It's like the weirdest thing. So, oh, yeah. you know, what my 
our CEO Ed says, you know, it's like tying your horse to a, to a, or tying your sports car to a horse, right? Or yeah, right. <laughs> we're going to the same kind of thing. It's like you're in the wagon looking in the rear view mirror and the train's coming. So what are, what are, you, what are you doing right. here? The yeah. purpose of c- cryptocurrency is not to collect a lot of it and then trade it in for dollars. Exactly. It's the exit. <laughs> it's right. divest. No, it's, no, 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 no. It's not that either. It's to create a new world. Exactly. So I'm saying you divest from one and, and yeah. take all that value. Every time you buy cryptocurrency, you're taking money out of the, the war economy. Yeah. And you're putting it in a different economy. And when I say when I say create a new world, I mean a new fucking world. New fucking world. Down Especially, down. but I think with all of them, but certainly with Anatha. I mean, that's you guys. That's what you're up to. Is you know, once you once you have a new currency, and once you control the currency, you can do anything you want. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and uh, the the birth of I mean, there's so many ways um, uh, cryptocurrency is it. All it really is is programmable money. But that concept is, is people can't understand, right? Because they think money operates a certain way inherently, like two plus two equals four always. Mm-hmm. Right. That it's always situated. And our economy is situated in a certain way to serve certain people's interests. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not all so nefarious per se, right? It's weirder than that. It's just a poorly designed system and a cruelly designed system. So when Natha, okay, um, you guys are producing a coin, am I right? It's Is live. It? Yeah, you go buy it. Oh, it's out there. Okay, good. I didn't know that. There's an Anatha coin. And what is what is Anatha up to? How is it different than the other altcoins? Um, you know, we're, we're, it's actually been kind of interesting taking it to market because it's so different than every other thing out there. But it's, it is, uh, we basically created an economy. Right. How do you sell an economy to someone? Oh, I know. Come partake in our economy. And on top of it is an interface. And and that interface, you can do certain things right now, mostly financial things. You can handle, manage your cryptocurrencies, what's called a wallet, portfolio management, you know, and soon we'll have a decentralized exchange. And then we'll have all these different pieces, including a social network. So what crypto is so good at is, you know, disintermediating Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the technology information companies, companies like Facebook and Google, they are corp. They are industrial age corporations, masquerading as information age entities. So what they've been able to do is mine information as if it were oil. The economic tools make it super simple for them to extract, because Exxon Mobil's over here and they're trying to take out oil. And they're digging. They're fighting wars to get it. Costs a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Well, you got Facebook and Google over here. And it's like they're doing the same economic tools, but it doesn't cost them anything. They're not fighting more. They're just, whoo, just taking all our information, all our attention, all our engagement and selling it and making money. Mm-hmm. And what smart contracts and um, uh, decentralized networks can do is manage all that. You can right. displace the need for that. And then all the revenue can flow back to participants, go back to you and me. Mm-hmm. Imagine that. Imagine you're on Facebook and every time you looked at an ad, you were served an ad, you were paid instantaneously. Right? Boom. Doo-doo-doo. You watch that ad. It's, just, it's a microtransaction. But it's happening all the time. It's just feeding up. You're in the app. It's part of the app. You're just getting money. And then you post something. And the post, you know, maybe you pay a little to post. And then you post it. And then other people start posting it. And you get rewarded for the, for the you know, or it depends on the design of the system. You design it any way you want, right? But that's one possible approach. And you keep making money off your information, your attention, and right. your engagement. You create content like these podcasts. You get paid. Other people post it. You get paid. They get paid also because they're curated. Everybody yeah. gets paid, participates. Right now, Facebook does the least amount within the whole exchange. Some manufacturer created some fruitcake new sneaker and they're trying to sell that shit to you. And they made some fancy ad and you're watching it. That sneaker company and the ad company, they spent some money. You looked at the ad. Facebook gets all the money. It's like, wait, 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 huh, wait. Right, right, and in the present financial system, economics, it's it's it would it's cost prohibitive for Facebook to pay. Mm-hmm. And what's nice about cryptocurrency is it's that it, you just put money and information along the same pipes. Do you have trouble falling asleep? Of course you do. <laughs> Don't we all these days? I know a lot of my friends do. I have my entire life trouble with sleep, but that's why I was so thrilled when Carlos and Vanessa Abelar the owners and operators of Paloma Verde CBD told me that they had just come out with this hybrid formula 
of melatonin and CBD in the same soft gel. Now, a lot of people consider that particular combination to be the gold standard for treating insomnia, and it works like magic for me. I swear by this stuff. Go to their store and check out their new product there, but while you're there, look at the whole store because guess what? We get 25% off everything because Carlos and Vanessa are good to us. We're good to them back. Use the discount code RENEGADE when you're there to get that 25% off. Now, many people's favorite thing, of course, is the unregistered combo pack, which is my three favorite Paloma Verde products. That is their delicious fruit-flavored gummies. I keep raving about these. I just took some right before I started recording this. 10 milligrams of CBD in each gummy. Mm. Their soft gels, 25 milligrams in each soft gel. This is the heavy medicine. I use two to six of these every day to keep me going, keep me stable, keep me balanced. But my favorite thing, because it's fast acting and high potency, it's their tincture. You put some drops under your tongue and you'll see your anxiety just melt away. So again, go to palomaverdecbd.com. Use the discount code RENEGADE to get that 25% off everything. Oh, the unregistered combo pack, that's 33% off. Again, palomaverdecbd.com. Discount code RENEGADE. 25% off everything. 33% off the combo pack, the thad pack. Thank you. Your body's going to be better. Your life's going to be better. And I'll be happy. No, no, because w- w- actually what I like about crypto and what I like about what Anatha's doing, we're a radical capitalist, right? Um, where Facebook is a subsidized corporate state. I mean, they're, it's, but they're, it's, I'm saying they're parasitic. They, they take our, they, they, we create the value, right? By typing stuff into Facebook. And by, and by giving them our information, you know, age, date, where we live, what we like, you know, and then clicking on their ads and showing them what we want to buy, right? And you create all the content. Facebook doesn't produce anything. You know, that's what I mean, right? So we create all the content, all the information, all the value, and then they take it and just sell it, right? right. It's, like, it's like buying and selling money. It's like what, it's what Wall Street does, but, but, but for exactly. information, but for information, right? Instead of buying and selling money, they buy and sell, they buy and sell information. Exactly. And or even- Or they just take information and they sell it, right? It's like Exxon Mobil, right? right. They're extracting it, but the point is, wait, who are you you're extracting it from me? Yeah. Why can't, shouldn't, shouldn't I see some of that? And that's why everyone went nuts over privacy, right? Facebook and privacy, which to me is a red herring. It's a byproduct. What they don't want you talking about is your information as property. Because if it's property rights, it opens up an unbelievable can of worms for them, right? Yeah. So they love to talk about privacy. Oh no, we'll protect your privacy. Oh yeah, you can turn that on and off. Yeah. Zuckerberg loves to go talk about that because as long as you're not talking about property. It's intellectual right? property, God damn it! It's my property came from my mind. And it's my information, it's me. My information. It's my image, it's my everything, right? Yeah, it's my, my click. I, I clicked on the ad or I didn't click on the ad. It's data that I produced. Yeah, and the fact is power to all those companies. We'll look back and we'll call them all robber barons, right? Yeah, right. Um, they just, they're, they're gonna have this brief period of a loophole, right? Where the rise of an information economy got coupled with an industrial age economic system, right? So you have this, all this value being unleashed by the internet, unleashed, right? Mm-hmm. New sources of value we never knew existed. And it's all just getting extracted as if it were oil. Mm-hmm. That's how our economic tools are set up, right? Mm-hmm. It's in order to extract oil from the ground, enormous amounts of capital and a huge duration between where I get the money, start drilling, refine it, ship it, and you use it. Mm-hmm. So fuck it, like some moment, you know what? You deserve a little money up front. Yeah, I get it. It's complicated. And that's why governments created corporations to do shit like that, right? Go build the railroads, go dig for the oil. I don't have the mm-hmm. will to, you know, the, or the, the, the capacity to do it. Um, right. But information... It's, 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 it's like, what, what exactly is Facebook doing? They made a really nifty ad engine. They made a kind of cool interface. What, what exactly did they do? And what exactly did they continue to do? And that can all be replaced for the most part. Um, not all, but they deserve something. It's a, it's a revenue sharing. You, you create it, you get some money, but all okay. of it. Okay, so now hold on though. I mean, doesn't all cryptocurrency disintermediate? Doesn't all cryptocurrency remove the intermediaries, remove the the parasitic corporations like Facebook who take our who mine our information and then sell it? Yeah, um, but they, so they disintermediate finance, right? Yeah. So, okay. right. So we're trying to. Our thing's a little funny because we kind of build um, 
I hate using the word consumer, but like an end user, supposed to engineers. A lot of the uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, mm-hmm. Ethereum, they're platforms. Mm-hmm. Okay. Platform. All of them, Ripple, they're platforms for other people to do things on. Okay. Right. They're built for engineers. We didn't do that. We built on some on, on something. We actually have our own blockchain, whatever. But we um, it, we created applications for people. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and the underlying behavior of that environment is a mechanism that automates the return of revenue to you. Yeah. So right now it's very simple. We don't have the ad engine. We don't have the social yet. Right. I and mean, that's a battle. We're building up to that. Right. It's like one thing at a time. You know, and you got to take over certain things and build your sort of, you know, runway so you can actually go up against Social networks. So, what's the platform for Anathos Coin? Is it is it Bitcoin? Is it a Bitcoin platform? No, it's its, its own. It was built on something called Cosmos. Okay, which is, which is it's actually great. I love Cosmos because it's like the blockchain of, of money. It's a blockchain of blockchain, so about interoperability. Mm. It's really like rhetoric to me, so I, I kind of love Cosmos. Um, but it, we have our own SDK and all that. It's a separate blockchain. Right? Okay, so we're like a, and then all that, yeah. And then for each transaction, am I right? There's a percentage that goes to some general fund. Somehow? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's a central mechanism, all automated, in which right now, whatever sources of revenue, here's the, here's the thing that's super nifty. We go back to economies. Our inflation, meaning we produce 1% new tokens every year. It started with about 7.8 billion or something, one token for every person alive. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's 1% a year. So obviously that number goes up. Um, but it's uh, 50% of that goes into this fund for the community. In the existing like Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the newly minted tokens, the inflation mm-hmm. goes to miners, goes to validators, goes to people who have to run the network. Okay. Right. And ours, 50% goes to them, 50% goes to the community. Wow. Um, so imagine the US government every time they printed money, hmm. just gave 50%. So you just got to check in the mail. <laughs> right? Like, why, why don't they do that? So, oh, no, they give it to banks right. to decide who to go. Like, Wait, what the fuck? Right? <laughs> so, that's what's great about, about all this currency, right? You just put value directly in people's hands and you can design it how you want, you know? Now, what do, do you guys have specific plans for the general fund, like what it will finance? Well, as I'm saying, it, we don't, it's a, it's a decentralized autonomous organization. We yeah. don't, that's what right I mean. Now we're just the developers of it. So, we don't decide anything. The community will decide. Okay. That's what it wants to decide. Right now, it's just automated. Goes back to people. Okay, that's what I was wondering. I thought you guys had particular ideas for what you wanted the general fund to do, like social welfare stuff. No, so we call it we call it a a bottom up universal basic income, right? Because it's you're generating. It's not extractive. It's not taking from the rich to give to the poor. It's not taxing corporations to give to everybody else. Your own activity generates the value. Right. You constantly receive it instead of going to Facebook. You receive it. Okay. Yeah. So it's, okay. It's a, it's a UBI without the state. It's UBI. And we call it bottom up. We generated. Yeah. Yeah. Self-generated. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. That's a big deal, man. If that works, if it happens to have. It's a deal, right. And it's, and it's super ambitious, right. It's hilariously, fantastically ambitious, but it's like, well, why not? I guess this is what's changed my politics so much. I just can't take any conversations about this politician or that politician seriously. I'm like, I'm trying to redistribute how value is created and shared fundamentally, all without the state and these corporations. You're a pirate. That seems more fucking interesting, right? I mean, you're a crypto, you're an anarcho crypto pirate. We are crypto anarchists through and through, baby. Dig it. Um, all right, let's um let's talk about. Let's see what I want to talk about. I, we got to talk about COVID, you know, because, you know, we've both read Foucault. And so we got to we have things to say about COVID. I also want to talk about politics sort of a, on the on the broadest level, like political language. You're not a fan. You're not a fan of political language, really. You're not a fan of the way that we talk about politics. Yes. No, I can't. I refuse to participate. I just there's no way in for me. I just I disagree with every term being given me, right? I, I don't like any of them. Really? What do you mean? Well, it's like I like the two plus two. Do you believe two plus two equals four or not? I'm like, why, why are you talking? You know, so you know, I I want to write the book of rhetoric finally. Like my I know my first book was an attempt to try to nail my what I believe rhetoric is, but I want to write another one that's really about rhetoric and ethics. Mm-hmm. It's called It Depends. <laughs> 
I don't. What's doing important? Depends. I, what are you asking me? You know, it's always, it's always situated, man. I don't know what to tell you. So, and these big things, people are debating. I don't know what the fuck anyone's talking about. Very confusing to me. And it's these, what happens, what I see happens is these narratives get set up. It's almost like video games. What I see is public discourse is basically video games in which the press is the video game creator. And they've created these kind of personas you can occupy. I'm a Trumper. I'm an anti-Trumper. I'm a vaxxer. I'm an anti-vaxxer. I'm a liberal. I'm a, right? You get, right. And they all fill these roles and then they have various terms of operation. What can you do if you're a Trumper? It's like picture you're in the video game and it's like the Kung Fu battle, right? You get to choose. I'm the Trumper right. I'm the, right. or whatever it is. And then you do battle, but you can only do what your character can do. And so then they go away and they go back and they feel really good about themselves or bad about themselves or angry and Nietzsche would call it reactive. It's resentment. It's it's living life, putting your this is the guys you don't like. You know the the, the situationists. I don't know if you, the Guy Debord decided. I like, love him. I like I like him. The infiltrate. You're infiltrated, right? So your whole emotional state and what you think is right and wrong and how you feel is defined by this public discourse. How fucking weird is that? Yeah. Weird is that? Yeah. The New York Times says I should be really upset by something. I'm upset. What the fuck are you talking about? Do you want to short circuit that at every step of the way? Every time one of those fucking feeds come into me, snap, 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 snap. I don't want any of that in me, right? Like, why would I ever react emotionally to an article one of those idiots writes? They define, it's a video game. And you see it played out on Twitter. So you're never surprised. No one has a nuanced position. Mm -hmm. No particular. Everyone's just playing their fucking role. You are an enigma because you... What I like about how you like tweet, Twitter's my favorite platform, is, and we can't ever quite place you, right? Everyone wants to place you. So you left the easier, right? Well, no, that's the whole point. You're your own man, right? It's radical, you're renegade, right? It's particular. Yep. I had um, my ex girlfriend's mother say to me, um, Are you a Democrat? I said, No. Oh, oh, you're a Republican. I said, No. She said, Wait, what? what? She said, This is a quote. What else is there? What yeah. else is there? Exactly my point. Exactly. It's, it's all these predetermined positions. I'm like, I don't like any of those things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, what happened to nuance and particularity? How, how come things how about, say yeah. it depends? You know? And how about this one? How about this one? Labeling your politics, labeling yourself around your politics. I'm a conservative. I'm a liberal. I'm a social. I'm a libertarian. I'm a. So why on earth you just announced that you're not going to think outside of this box. Yeah. The, the, funny, the one that's taking the longest for me to kind of try to wrap my head around, I still really haven't, is somebody calling themselves a libertarian. Like, wait. Right. You, uh, wait, did you really just again just do that? Did you? <laughs> no, it's, it's oxymoronic. Like, no, punishment? That's why, you know, the Deleuze class, the Deleuze Watcher class, I want to call the uh, non-fascist life. Mm -hmm. Right, that's why I wanted to title it. And that is that thing. Because what is it to leave the non-fascist life in a libertarian or a, or Antifa? Or I don't even know how to pronounce that. Or you know, they think they're non-fascist, but of course, it's, a, well, it's mobs acting with a unified belief. I don't know. I, I believe in massive proliferation of difference. Lots Ooh. of different positions, which is what I thought libertarianism was in my mind before I ever stumbled into it. And I was like, oh no, no it's. it's generally very close-minded, closed world, as close as Democrats or Republicans. I'm like, that's not liberating at all. That's not liberty at all. And that was sort of a hilarious moment for me. And I, I know I'll lose tons of people now who call themselves these things, but I, why call yourself anything? I don't understand that will. It's a you, bizarre world. You stand for a massive proliferation of difference. You just oh, said yeah. that. That's fucking it. Yeah, of course. Damn. Uh, How do you create an ethical system? How do you create a system of governance? That's the tricky part, right? How do you, how do you, what, what mode of governance facilitates, breeds, and foments the proliferation of difference, the celebration of difference? Nothing worse than the liberals talk about tolerance. We tolerate difference. Like, like, you're, like you're so special, you deign to tolerate my fucking perversion. Right. Fuck the fuck off. I want a system that doesn't care, doesn't tolerate or not tolerate, but it's just systemically supported as a site of difference. Right. T tolerance is saying, okay, we'll put up with your difference. Actually, we'll put well, up. Okay, okay, you can be a pervert or queer, whatever the fuck you are. Like, yeah, no. we don't approve of it, but we'll we'll let you do it. So you're it's so I love it because it's so hilariously perfect, right? I you're pr you're promoting and celebrating difference in itself. 
Yeah. So that's just to be clear, that's the entire Deleuze Squattery project. Is right? it? Yeah. So Deleuze's first book is called Difference and Repetition. Oh, shit. After his book is called Difference in Itself. And I'll talk about that, right? Because until that, that's the very premise of this, right? How do you, all these other modes take, seek a position, right? But difference undoes its own position, right? It becomes a, it becomes a becoming. Yeah. Fascists hate that because fascism is a unified theory about all things, right? They're, it goes they're, back to our science thing, right? I yeah. never understood why scientists want a unified theory. It's like, that's the wrong will. Isn't the unified theory of all things, each thing has its own theory? Mm -hmm. There's as many theories as there are things and more because you can see each thing from multiple angles. Why would you ever even want a unified theory? What's the value of that? What a perverse will. I think, yeah, I think by definition, it's totalitarian, right? It's a claim about the total. The total. We have, we have knowledge about all things at once, simultaneously, and they all fit together according to our ideas in this system that we have imposed on the world through which we are claiming that all things somehow are connected. The ant and the cloud and Hillary Clinton's speech and your glasses are all part of the somehow... Think about the arrogance, the totalitarian imperialist arrogance, cos cosmological arrogance. We, we claim to know that the fucking stars are somehow connected to this thing, right? Yeah, it's fantastic, right? It's such a crazy will. It's like, what? really? Why would you even want to do that? I want to create as many theories as there are things. There's as many concepts as there are things, not just things, not just leaves is one thing, each leaf. Mm-hmm. The whole interpretation of the cosmos. And if you wanted to take the time to extrapolate and build it out, the world would begin to look like the thing behind me, Matthew Ritchie painting, right? Like coming into being and shifting and morphing. And that's the Deleuze Guattari world. It's a world I fucking love. It's decentered, it's joyful, it's constantly, it's joyful it doesn't mean it's not without pain, right? People think joy and happiness are the same thing. Mm. I'll say that. It's, there's a lot of ugliness in joy, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Death is joyful in its way, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. Life happening, which is death happening. Um, yeah, a world of con this, uh, constantly undulating, constantly situated, constantly morphing. You're always in a position speaking to other positions. And that's just a worldview. And I like that worldview because, not because it's true, but because of the effect it has, which is the fomenting prolif uh, 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 the proliferation of difference. Because of that worldview, because Deleuze and Guattari create all these figures and concepts and modes of operation, the way they write their philosophy, their modes of operation, they give us a whole ethics, a whole governance module, a whole way to see the world that doesn't constantly seek to reduce things to buckets, but seeks their proliferation and sees, just thinks it's fucking gorgeous. It doesn't mean things don't group together. It just means that I don't have to seek the group. Things will group together on their own, like a planet, like a solar system, There's gravitational pull, like a romantic relationship, right? You end up going around other bodies. So you're, so you like diversity? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so post-diversity, well, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, talk about the difference between diversity, the way it's talked about, right? The way that term is used, what it means in popular discourse. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't what you're talking about. What's the yeah, difference? Yeah, that's, that's talking about about these set categories, which are super abstract. Woman, right? African-American and black. I don't know if we're supposed to say anymore. Um, and I'm not saying I'm for or against these things, but yep. it's a very, very different will that seeks to abstract you away from the particularity. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, one thing that's great about Deleuze and Guattari, they talk about you know, like these modes of becoming, right? So we take on different modes, right? The, 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 male or female, the dog, the rock. They call it rock becoming, dog becoming, man becoming, woman becoming. And you see it all going through me. I'm, what is it? Man becoming is a, is a shape, it's a mode of going. It's not tethered to your skin and bones only, right? Or your dick or your testosterone or whatever, right? It's a, it's a mode of going and you see it. I, look, I just got a dog this week, right? My son did at least, right? And I look at that dog, I'm like, oh, you look a little like a mule deer. And he has a kind of energy of a mule deer, right? Like, what does it mean a dog? All dogs are the same? No, dogs operate all kinds of ways, right? And they have cat becoming and they have human becoming and they have deer becoming and they have God becoming and whatever they, we are these assemblages of all these different modes of, of how to go in the world. 
right? I'm not just one thing, I'm all these different things and I'm a localization of all these different things. The discourse of difference, uh, sorry, the discourse of diversity actually reduces difference. Exactly, yeah, it's, just, it's part of the same regime, exactly. Because of, according to that discourse, what's important about you and me is that we're white and we're men rather than your individual life and experience and thoughts and behaviors and my individual life and experience, right? It's no longer about Daniel and Thad and what you ate for breakfast versus what I ate for breakfast and versus all the different thoughts that you had today, which are totally different than all the thoughts that I had. It's that you and I are part of these same groups. Exactly. It's the erasure of difference. Now, yes. I understand from a policy level, that's why I don't do policy. I can understand why from a policy level, you might want abstractions. I don't know. I don't choose to participate. I understand how, because a system inherits its, you know, I, I, again, like currency was created. Money was created that we all use to serve the people who had all the money, right? US dollar was created by people in a certain way to operate in a certain way that they could print it and give it to themselves. That's how this whole thing was built up. It's rigged from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to policy, I understand re-rigging systems. Cryptocurrency is trying to re-rig a system, right? Things like affirmative action might be trying to re-rig a system. To be perfectly honest, I don't know. I have no fucking idea. I've never thought about it. I don't particularly care. I trust you world will figure the fuck out and leave me alone, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. So the point is it's localized. So sometimes two plus two is four. When I need, when I'm teaching arithmetic to a five-year-old who needs, needs to know how to add numbers together so he knows how to, I don't know, count his money. Right. So then two plus two is four. It's situational. Okay. That's true. In that situation, I want it to be true because it works. The question is, what does it do? What are its effects? Right. Does it inaugurate? What happens because of this? Not, is it true or not? But what happens because of it? The discourse of diversity reduces difference. Look what we just did. Okay. That's mind blowing. I've never put that together. Hmm. Again, though, I got to be clear that I don't understand policy, right? So I'm not just, you know, kowtowing to liberals. I don't know. I truly don't know. No, but making us into men and white people is right or, or, much, or black or female or yeah. whatever. Well, it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, it reduces the, the particular differences. That's Necessary. right. Necessarily. Exactly. That's what all words do. Damn. Right? So Nietzsche's great moment, right? He's like, you, you look at the, um, he said, all words are metaphors or interpretations that you have forgotten that have become your environment. So when you look up at the moon, you say, that's the moon. The moon simply is somebody had a poetic moment. Somebody looked up at the moon and they spent, I'll say it, months, right? Which is, mm -hmm. they get, right? They get months trying to figure out the right word. And they're like, oh, it's months. Look at that thing. That's the thing of months, mm -hmm. the thing of time. And I love that French or Italian guy. They're just like, or woman, whoever the fuck it is. Light, your light. Check out the light. You know, like, it's great. And that's a beautiful poetic moment. We just forgot it was. So we just keep using it over and over again. Right? And that's, yeah. What an indictment of, you know, the politics of human relations departments. What an indictment of the politics of universities that are always grouping people, always reducing individual differences yeah. and always putting us into these broader categories. It's yeah, I get it might be their purview to be fair. Again, I don't know. I truly don't know. What do you know. know? What do you not know? What are you talking about? I'm saying that a, that a university might want a, 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 a student body yeah. right, to be from different parts of the world, different parts of the country in the, in the hopes of fomenting a certain kind of uh, play. I truly don't know. I don't deal with policy. I have that luxury. I don't know. Okay. Because the fact is dealing with everyone as an individual is a funny thing because from a, from a uh, institutional level, from a, right. from a government institutional level. Right. Because the system's been rigged for a long time, right? Yeah. For instance, we don't all have an equal ability to become Jeff Bezos. We just, we don't, right? Sure. So that has to be obvious, right? Sure, sure. The foundation of the country was of such, course. that was always the case. It's always been poor rich people. Right. The rich people created the system to perpetuate the system. Of course. They didn't create a system to make it more equal. That's insane. Right. The U.S. Constitution didn't do that. That'd be insane. Why would they do that? They're not giving up their power. They created a system, right? They can't say it's a, you, if you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It doesn't make any sense. We're all in different places. Always already, right? Yep. Okay. 
I got you. So you're saying the re-rigging of the system might be necessary or a good thing or beneficial in yeah, some way. Yeah, I, I understand it. I understand. It doesn't seem insane to me. Okay. Um, I don't know whether it's good or bad. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I choose not to. Be. But dude, I just, we just went through this. We just went, you, you are for the proliferation of difference. And we just proved that diversity in its current iterations, right? Reduces difference. So that's your enemy, bro. Except in some situations, I mean, it's again, like <laughs> things coalesce, right? Okay. So let's say I'm making um, cookies, right? I put in flour, I put in sugar, I put in all these different things. And then I make an assemblage and this is another thing. It's, it's local. I want that cookie. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eradicate the difference of the sugar in that thing because I like the way it goes with flour. I like the way it goes with chocolate. You know what's going on here? It's, it's the fundamental difference between you and me. It's our personalities. Our, here's how they're different. I like to fight. Yeah, you do. And you don't. Ah, it's so boring to me, I got to tell you. Right. I'm a I know you got, and that's, again, boring for me. I'm not saying it's essentially boring. Oh, I'm not saying it's a good way to live at all, believe me. But I just, the way I'm built, you know, I just, I'm a, I've always been a fighter. Yeah, you like picking at it. Like you are posting things on that Twitter. I'm like, what are you yeah. doing with that? Like what? You have like will to engage people that would never even fucking occur to me. <laughs> I want to be invisible. I'm invisible I and I want to be quiet and I want no one to notice me so I can be as free as possible. It's because my mommy left when I was five. I need, I need attention. I don't know. I guess that's what everybody thinks. All right. Um, so let's do, um, let's talk about life and the lack of it recently. No. So you and I have not seen each other in person, even though we live basically in the same city since what, like January, I think of 2020 or something like that, right. um, which makes me very sad. Although we're going to, we're going to correct that soon. We're going to take a lot of drugs and walk through Golden Gate Park, which is what you're supposed to do if you live in San Francisco, except everybody forgot that. And just, they sit at their computers all day long. Um, so, uh, yeah, man, let's hear the Daniel Caffeine take on COVID, lockdowns, masking, because we got to do this. And, you know, obviously our boy Foucault had a lot to say about things just like this. And yeah. the guy I had on last week, Jeff Schulenberger, has written extensively about the Foucauldian critique of lockdowns and masking, et cetera, the politics of disease, biopolitics, the managing of bodies, the regulation of bodies. I mean, I don't know if you want to go there, but just yeah, what I, what's what's your, I don't know what, I don't know like at first I thought because you didn't want to ever see me but now I found out it's a very good particular reason in your life to be careful during but what's the so I don't I never really got like your take on the whole the politics of the thing or whatever I mean what's it's it's just so fantastically complicated yeah uh, and because it, it, there's such an existential thing right so like I'm a, I'm a bit of a hypochondriac right so like I. I don't care what the state says. I'm, I don't want to fucking get sick. Right. Sure. Like, I'm, you know, sure. um, and then, you know, I never like being told what the fuck to do. I understand sometimes there's a need, there's, there's a, not a need. There's a uh, rationale that I can understand and get behind to, to, for the public to enforce certain things. Right. Mm -hmm. Rather it not come from the government, rather be peer to peer. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think I'd ever support government mandates. I, I have watched, you know, the, the reality of this lockdown is it, you know, it's done phenomenal damage to my son. Um, and I've attempted to have a civil action suit against the fucking state for what they did to kids and the Whoa. mental collapse of isolation and fear and not being going to school and all that shit. And my kid's a basket case. I don't necessarily want to get into that in the public here. Right. But I've had to yeah. deal with a teen and I, pisses me off. But then the reality is I don't, I never wanted my kid to go to school at all. School is just wrong. So the mandate, so the COVID mandates, it's just like people get all worked up. I'm like, yeah, but I don't want my kid to go to school at all. Can we actually change the fucking conversation here? Right. Um, and let me decide how does the state mediate my relationship to my son and never cease to, I just don't understand it. Amazing. Don't understand it. And I grew up and I just assumed school was good because I was good at school. Right. My parents all PhDs, you go to school. School is good. I'm good at school. Keep going to school. Okay. Never thought about it. My kid's not good at school. He's good at some other things. He's not good at school. In fact, having to perform at school has made, has, has had disastrous psychological effect on him. Um, and it's, that's what's turned me, frankly, most explicitly into an anarchist. I was very happy to stumble on, you know, cryptocurrencies, a way to facilitate and govern and create an actual alternative world. Um, 
But then, so the, the COVID thing happens, I'm like, well, okay. That's, it's, it's redundant in so many ways, you know, that I don't, I don't, I, don't I, I see people posting today that they're like, well, you know, a school mandating vaccines, it's always been the case. Why has that suddenly changed? But then what I see from the, from the, the liberal side, I only know from the Twitter. It's all I know, to be clear, right? I, my only thing into my house is the Twitter, besides my son, an occasional woman, um, is uh, this idea that, um, oh, I just lost my fucking thought there. I thought about women, Thaddeus, and I lost my train of thought. Don't ever do that. That's what happens. That's what happens to me. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, you know about the rule in boxing, right? You're not supposed to have sex for like during training camp. Yeah, that's a need to talk about that. That's the yeah. the aesthetic, the aesthetic as an affirmation of power rather it, than it, power. it does. So, it saps your strength, uh, women and sex especially. So don't mix the two when you're when you're in here fighting with me yeah you want to <laughs> keep them out so you said women and all of a sudden i lost my so right. so you don't so from the liberal side you don't like what they're saying about covid that's where you were going something about li well, liberal. I, yeah and I, but i don't i'm not sure i buy what liberals don't understand they say what i gather from the twitter again is yep. that people against the vaccine don't believe in science whatever that means it's right. so many moves that I don't agree with any of them. <laughs> I know. Right? I'm like, okay, what? Um, but what they fail to ever take into consideration is it's that people don't believe what they're being fucking told. It's not that they don't believe it's true. It's that they don't believe it's true because you're not telling the truth, whatever newspaper this is, right? So it's happened. In, it's the fundamental postmodern condition, right? Where every there's no source of truth. And the fact is this particular virus has seemed so sneaky from what I can gather, right? That it's it's super hard to say what the how it's gonna operate. You have all these people gotta make policy, and all these people have to oppose policy, making these sweeping decisions. And, and they assume you need to make the same decision. You know, so I ventured out on the, the Twitter and entered my first time entering really public discourse. And I said, what's the argument for mandating vaccines? Right. What's the argument? I don't, I just don't know, I get it. If you want to. I got the vaccine and I'm taking on the risk of getting the vaccine. Mm -hmm. That's on me. I yeah, get it. Sure. You know, I love vaccines. Shoot me full of fucking every vaccine, right? I die. I'm going to die anyway. I'm over 50. What the fuck? This is all gravy anyway, right? <laughs> um, my kid has not had the thing. Anyway, um, but you make certain decisions. Why, why, if someone wants to get COVID or risk getting COVID, what's the problem? And I still don't quite, I, I, I get there's arguments about mutations, there's arguments that if everyone got vaccinated, it would go away. I'm like, I'm not sure that's true. I don't know whether it's true or not. If that were true, I would say, yeah, you, should, you all got to get fucking vaxxed, right? Because that makes sense. A society has the right to, to determine itself. So the fact is, I want to be free, and I want to be free to fuck, and that means being able to not risk. It's like AIDS, you know. Like I, I, I hate to have to put on a condom. COVID is so much worse, right? Because it's, it's you can't protect yourself, right? Yeah. And I got to be able to get laid. So I look at my politics always from my situation. What allows me to operate with my maximum pleasure day to day from the society level? I don't know. I, 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 I can see all the different arguments. There's so many different ones. A lot of them are incoherent mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are filled with a lot of homonyms, a lot of anger, a lot of affects, like weird movies, mm -hmm. and drama, and people get all worked up one way or another. And I'm like, I don't get any of that. <laughs> I get that the whole virus actually seems quite tricky. It doesn't seem like polio. It doesn't seem like the kind of thing that's ever going to get eradicated. It's more like the flu. It mutates and you deal with it year to year, you know? Mm -hmm. But I, the fuck do I know? You know, I just navigate it for myself. Fair and enough. Yeah. You're, into, you're into difference and you're being different. Yeah. Being you're like, man. You know, we'll do what works, works for me. I don't make anyone do anything else. I, it seems weird to make other people do things. Now, um, what? Now, what if there was some global governmental conspiracy to have a great reset and this is this is just a a move to sort of force us into a chinese communist model where we have social credit scores and surveillance and the government knows what are what's in our bodies and they want to put experimental experimental drugs in our bodies and they want to establish or reestablish their sovereignty over our bodies by telling us what we must put into them etc cetera, etc cetera. do you care you don't what if that's all true the fact is they've already been doing that but i don't understand oh. what the government has done so well if that's true 
Right. What the government has done so well is make you fight about COVID and ignore everything fucking else in which they dominate your life and infiltrate you and surveil you. Right now, there's a bill before the fucking Senate, right, around crypto. They're sneaking into the infrastructure bill, right? And what they want is that for every time, like I have various wallets to handle various cryptocurrencies, they want all that to be KYC AML compliant. They want every time I transact at all with my, with my wallet and send Bitcoin or whatever the fuck I have, I actually don't have a lot of Bitcoin to whoever I'm sending something to, they want to know. And mm-hmm. they mandated it. They said it's Elizabeth Warren and these nut jobs, right? And what they've done is explicitly say that money, the financial system, is a surveillance system. That's what they said. They're arguing. Mm-hmm. Because you're dealing with money, we have a right to see it. It's like, oh, well, damn. well, and the idea is that we'll lose, oddly enough, right, to the Citizens versus United, which said money is free speech yeah. and it can't be controlled, right? Yeah. It's be- first of all, um, you didn't you say something about you don't care about policy? <laughs> <laughs> well, this affects my life very directly. Okay. Uh, yeah, I respect I respect them going down fighting them. Right? There's imagine having a monopoly. You've been the federal government. And you produce money. You, you have a monopoly on money. Yeah. All of a sudden, there's all these people making a lot of money, not using your money. They're gonna fight. It's a it's this is straight up war. Well, what I've seen from that wing of the political uh, culture, the Elizabeth Warrens, the liberal Democrats who care about crypto. It's not all of them, but a lot of them are getting increasingly nervous about crypto. And what they've been saying, at least on Twitter, <laughs> is that the problem with crypto, and I've seen them say this explicitly, I think Chris Hayes said the very same thing of MSNBC the other day, is that it allows people to avoid paying taxes. Oh, sure. So, yeah. and because we are, op- because it's our responsibility, we're obligated to pay tax. And in a sense, we are thieves, I think, in their minds for not paying taxes because we then benefit from what the tax society gives us. Yeah, it's, it's hilariously insane, right? Um, well, because we're, we're decidedly opting out of that. There's a few things. One is you can, you mm-hmm. can um, operate, transact cryptocurrency and never enter the system of the U.S. dollar. Right, right. It's a system, it's computers and tagging and all kinds of things. Right, mm-hmm. you can operate without it. So, do they have any right to that? Mm-hmm. It's a private, it's my own world. I'm, I'm. What do you want from me? I, why, why should you get anything from me? Right, and that's been some of the arguments. Right. Yeah. Um, again, I got. I have not followed closely. Obviously, people in my company do. I just read their summaries and shit like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's a. The, the move to surveil all financial transactions and declare that, that that's the reason is hilarious because it's, it, that's, the, that's the ultimate fastest move. I, you, can't, you can't assign or transact value yep. without the state knowing about it. Without, yep. right? Now, of course, what's great about crypto is it's all transparent. It's just not tied to me as a citizen of the state. Right, cryptocurrency is all transparent. There's there's no way to kind of cheat the system. It's all transparent. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. So it's a bizarre. It's about citizenship. So here's this amazing thing they did. They created this society with all these rules and institutions, yeah. and then they said that, oh, Daniel, you're a member of the society because you were born here. Oh, so the way that Americans think about that is, it's wonderful. We got rights because of that. We get rights. We get the bill of rights and we get to vote and and decide who our leaders are because of that. Oh, it turns out there's also a whole bunch of responsibilities that they imposed on us. And all we were, all that happened is we happen to be born here. We just happened to be born here. We had obviously nothing to do with that, but then they said, Oh no, you've got to pay taxes to fund this thing and that thing and the other thing. And if you don't do that, you're a bad person, by the way. Not just a bad person. You go to jail. It's a felony. Yeah, it's, right. It's, it's incredibly backed by a very. Uh, so well-off. you're not allowed. You're not allowed to have your own money and have your own rules and your own social welfare system through Anatha. You're not allowed to do that because you were born in our country that we created with its own rules, bro. You exactly. have obligations to us. That's exactly the claims, right? And that's uh, not just the claims. That's the stakes. The arrogance. It's the, it's, the, it's the end of the nation state, right? You end the monopoly on money. You will still need some kind of local shit though, right? Someone's got, you know, there's, there's various things we need to deal with collectively, right? So the nation state doesn't disappear completely, but it's under siege. 
It sure and is. They know it. And it's a lot of it, I think, I assume comes down to their personal portfolios, right? I mean, they're trying to legislate for their own portfolios. Oh, you think? Yeah, they don't do U.S. dollar tank. They don't want everybody divesting from the U.S. dollar. No, right? but I mean, no, but they care about the United States of America as a nation state. They care about the IRS. They care about their government programs that they created. Yeah. I mean, they want that. Funding. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. And but it's I don't. And most importantly, their money is wrapped up in that system. The way they make all their money um, is in that system, which does all those things. And and it's and they've allowed all kinds of things, hedge funds, and yeah. all kinds of speculative instruments that are insane. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and that's. You know, well, yeah. I mean, considering that Goldman Sachs funds every base, every politician, you know, I mean, and where do they get their money from? So, okay. I, I can see there's some self-interest in this, but I think it's mostly ideological. I think that liberals are true believers and they really want this particular society that they created and they want us to participate in. They think that we should. That's the funny thing. They think that we are fundamentally, morally, naturally obligated to participate, to give, to sacrifice ourselves, to give our stuff to it only because we happen to be born here and not in Guatemala. Yeah, can you imagine huh? their position, the, the, how beautiful it was for a while when no one questioned this. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm an American, I'm a citizen, I get yeah. these things, I do these things, and no one questioned it. It would all begin shredding. In front of us, they're like, wait, no, 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 wait, no, 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 right? And it's, mm-hmm. and, and it, it's hilarious just to watch this very old world. And they'll go down fighting and they'll prolong it for a while. But you, you watch them ending, right? The, the the information economy will is undermining the very ground of the industrial economy, which is we print money, we centralize it all, we build big things with it, right? It's this this whole assumption about how value will flow, accumulate, and be distributed, right? And as the state, I own all this stuff, and I need to build the roads and all. I need massive amounts of centralized capital capital to do that. And I'm going to get that from all my citizens and pay it back to them. That whole model is completely fucked up because first of all, it's never the case, mm-hmm. right? They're printing money and they're giving it to themselves. And our infrastructure, we've been in San Francisco recently, it's collapsing, right? It's almost unlivable, mm-hmm. right? Certain people are living very well, right? It's, mm-hmm. They rig the whole fucking thing, right? <laughs> sort of from the get-go. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Um, that's that's the the hardest thing for liberals to understand when you're talking to them about cryptos. They think that m- the problems of the world can be solved by like, oh, let's get a, a create a philanthropic organization and take money and give it to these people. They don't. They never take into consideration that the whole thing is is rigged. It's the system actually works perfectly. We don't have a broken system. It's a fundamental flaw of liberal opposition. Right, or what they imagine is their opposition, yep. is that they don't understand that the system's actually operating just as it's supposed to. And you put these little band-aids on it, and that's fine. They love that. But when you start fucking with it through cryptocurrency and make a new money completely outside your money system, forget it. Yeah. And they talk about shadowy figures. That's the best phrase Elizabeth Warren used. Shadowy figures. What? <laughs> as opposed, like, wait, it's again one of those hilarious things. Imagine the Federal Reserve doesn't have shadowy figures. But Bitcoin is openly accessible. Again, I'm not a big Bitcoin guy per se, but, mm-hmm. but it happens to be an example of something that's op- absolutely open, transparent. It's at least <laughs> compared to the US dollar. Exactly. It's very funny, very peculiar. Hilarious. So you're saying they can't stop it. They can't stop cryptocurrency. Governments can't stop this. Genie's out of the bottle. That's the idea is it's unstoppable. Yeah, because it's distributed. So let's say, yeah. you know, when, when, when the Fed shut down um, Backpage. Mm-hmm. Is God forbid women should make a living and right. sex. Um, they just went to one office and s- took the machines. Right. Distributed systems, decentralized systems. Where do you go? Yep. I got. I got to find that guy in Thailand. Maybe I can find him in this one somewhere in Australia, and then another one pops up. The minute it's whack a mole, they would never be able to do it. This is why our two most popular courses at RU have been so far: introduction to cryptocurrency and. <laughs> And 3D printed guns, same idea, same issue, same thing. All right, so we are in quite a mess. Well, I don't know, you don't seem to care, but I mean, I think our society is in quite a mess. And um, oh I, don't, I don't like living here anymore. Um, Me either. And now you are going to be teaching this course on these very important philosophers, Gilles Deleuze and Felix, or I don't know how you say it in French, Guattari, Guattari. Um, and um, so... 
here and you're a huge fan of that theirs of course and this is why you're teaching them um but i want to know can you remember the first time you read them sure um yeah i you know i'm i'm in grad school um it, this is early 90s and um you know, I, I did my undergraduate work on Foucault and a command, and I'm I'm, I'm, a little, I'm not sure I want to be there to begin with, right? I'm not mm -hmm. sure it went out of me that much. I'm really into Kierkegaard, mm -hmm. and I and I I start to do some a lot of the Deleuze wasn't translated yet, and I, I translated some of this Deleuze from different repetition just to pass my French exams, right? And I was like, I don't understand a fucking word of this thing. I just don't understand, and I kind of just sort of let it go. And then a couple years later, my great mentor who died during lockdown from something else, um, broke my heart a million pieces. Um, we were, anyway. um, yeah, he turned me on. I, I, it was time for me to write my dissertation and I was going to write on Kierkegaard and the ironic life. And um, he, me and a couple of people read some Deleuze in this book, Difference of Repetition. And it was the first time in a long time at that point, I was a very cocky little fucking know-it-all. But I was like, I don't, I don't understand a word. I, I, sometimes people would say things. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand a word you're saying. I don't understand. And I stopped writing. I live. I, I just did nothing for like a year. I, I felt stupid. I, I was baffled. I, 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 everything had been undone for me. And I thought I was done. And then one day I wake up. I'm like, huh? Huh. and I got, I got obsessed with this figure of repetition. Um, and once I understood repetition and the logic of repetition and the operation of repetition is about 1997, I, everything exploded and just began. Poof, 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 poof. And since then, I, you know, I've read some other things and all the shit and they, but they, I love, I, I love all the more the way they operate, mm -hmm. you know, um, the joy, the proliferation, the complexity, the, the humor, you know, um, it's, it's, it's super fun. It's like, it's like, why wouldn't any, everybody want to be here? You know, when I was doing it at, at, at Cal back then, you know, they were considered fruitcake. Huh. And Philippe, uh, may he rest in peace, really, you know, turned me on to it. But the rest of the department, some of whom were some very big names in this world, um, were not so enamored, you know. And I, I was a little early. And right? so my ultimate chapter, my dissertation is on Deleuze. You know, and I opened with, the classic guys and then Derrida and deconstruction and then role policy phenomenology and then Deleuze and it, it was fruitcake. No one's taking it seriously. And it's since taken off. I'm not sure how it's read in the academy. Um, I worry about that, but I don't know. Foucault wrote an introduction, right? To yeah. the, the first book. And what did he say about them? Yeah. He said a, a, a title could be an introduction to the non-fascist life. Boom. Yeah. Cause it's about, it, it's, Again, how do you enter a world in which you're often the biggest fascist is the one inside you, right? The one who wants to name yourself. Yeah. Wants to make guilt is a great one. If that's the yeah. one you beat yourself, right? Yeah. Then there's a self-proclamation. I am this thing. That's the inner fascist. Totally. Yeah. It's um it's not an introduction, it is a world. Yeah. Right? It's an it's a world in which, as we've talked about, difference is valued. And yeah. fascists don't like that. That's that's uh, anathema to fascists and communists and really anybody, right, with a political ideology, essentially, because they want to unify people. That's every, so you can picture, so not, so science is operating a certain way, right? And they say, yeah. okay, all those different leaves, they're so different from each other, but you know, let's just call them leaf. Right? <laughs> all yeah. those different things, right? That's one way to do it, right? right. Political systems the same way, the will to abstraction. Right, is this will. And that will runs through science, it runs through the humanities, it runs through the academy, and it oh. comes up in these forms. It's what will do you have that you want to unify all these things and not just let them be? I just like all those leaves. I don't got to call them. I call that one George and that one Lucy and that one Matt. So I, why do I got to call them all the same thing, leaf? And political systems all do that. And what's super exciting about the Lizard Glass is they begin to try to inaugurate or sort of launch these concepts and figures that allow a difference to maintain difference without everything just becoming a gurgle of, 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 of gray, right? Everything maintains its multicolored hue. It doesn't just become a unified field of gray. I've been actually obsessed with, um, I've watched the show a million times, but the show Deadwood. Right. Um, and Deadwood is just a great example. I was thinking about maybe incorporating some of it into the Deleuze class, but figure out, right? Because that's a great example of um, 
what some people might call anarchy, but of self-governance in which difference is the dominant, the reigning thing, right? You right. Don't, I don't have to say, oh, I know what's better for you. And one of the brutal things about how Deadwood and the society forms in that show, and presumably in that Western frontier, is such that you might care for someone, but you don't have to determine what's right for them. You can mm -hmm. be with them without determining over them. We don't have to, we don't have to um, meet and transact through a third category. I can just interact directly with you, peer to peer, right? My difference, your difference. We go together, we don't. We're attracted to each other, we're not. We enjoy conversing, we don't. We don't have to mediate. So much of the social is mediated. I think about that, my new neighborhood, the alarm is going off constantly. It's car alarm, right in front of my house, every night. My first thought, of course, is the police. Mm -hmm. The social is mediated by a third party. Of course, I would never call the police, to be clear. Um, but I was like, what? What then is my remedy? What? How do? How is society formed in such a way that my relationship with you is peer to peer and it's not mediated through a common thing? And 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 Deadwood's a great example of sometimes it's brutal, but that's it's also beautiful. And that, it's not absent pathos, it's not absent sympathy, just the opposite. Incredible co feeling with other people without saying you need to do different. You need to do like I do. No one ever says that. Yeah. That's beautiful thing of the American frontier. It's an obsession of Burroughs, if you give a shit. That was his thing that America went awry. Like it had this moment where it could have done that. I think I think that for thinkers like Deleuze and Guattari, um, it for people who consider themselves individualists and people who value freedom, like personal freedom, individual freedom, I think that the philosophy they are offering is the sort of the deepest iteration of that politics it's the it's the most i feel like it's it's really sort of the most fundamental philosophical statement really of what people usually call individualism or personal liberty except what gets complicated of course is that yes. the individual is an assemblage yes i'm right? yes. part woman i'm part yes. tree i'm part rock i'm part dog i'm part cat I'm, right yeah. um so they undo the individual at the same moment they constitute it because the individual then be, would otherwise become another fascist node sure sure, sure. Know, i am this thing i'm that is i only do these things you and i do that all the time about ourselves right yeah that's just how i am you say that right a little bit that's the internal fascist in us right yep the flip side of it it's also nice it's also it's ambivalent it's complicated and that's okay too right it's freedom right. man i i think it's i just think it's the deepest form of freedom does that make sense yeah <laughs> Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I know they, would, they wouldn't use that word, but I just think that people who use that concept, I think that they'll find the most freedom in this philosophy. How about that? Yeah. And that, again, that's why I wanted to, you know, you and I went back and forth with a few different uh, descriptions of the course and why I ended, why I said, how about we call it the non fast introduction of fascist living? Yeah. Because um, that's one way into them. There's a lot of ways into them, but that's one way in. Um, that when I read that introduction by Foucault, I, I read it after I read the book. Um, I, I mean, come on, it's fucking perfect. Beautiful. Yeah. So beautiful. Perfect. Daniel Coffeen's live webinar on Deleuze and Guattari begins September 7th, and I will be a student. Please join me. Go to renegadeuniversity.com slash courses for more information and to enroll. Well, my good, dear friend, uh, we're going to do drugs soon. Please. And take some walks and yeah. talk. Um, yeah. Thank you for another fabulous, this was so fun. This flew by. It's almost two hours and I just, I didn't even notice it. This is so yeah. fun. Same. And the shit we talk about, I got to tell you. It's fun. Yeah, I hope it's coherent. I don't know. I think so. So I hope it made some sense. I think so. I think it was great. And I can't wait for the Deleuze class. That's going to be a blast. I love, I just love, I just love watching, I love watching you teach. It's just so fun. It's I think fun. I might open with Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock playing that. Star Spangled Banner and how oh, yeah. it reorganizes the world. Anyway, it totally does. My brother, I'll see you soon. Thank you for doing this. Pleasure, my friend. Peace. Bye. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To join the new Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. To join the new Unregistered Underground, the supporting listeners group for the podcast, go to unregisteredunderground.com. Thanks for listening.